The purpose of this post is to actually speak directly to Stephen Housden, owner of the Little River Band trademark, and Wayne Nelson, uh, frontman and leader of the current uh, performing iteration of the Little River Band. I had reached out to you directly um, with the with the invitation to speak to you because you see, back in January I had done a post on the Little River Band because I do posts on music. I celebrate the music and the memories. I don't do shock pieces. I, I I look for you know positive ways to talk about the music and associate it with people's memories. And for me, for a very long time, the Little River Band's music has been a a deeply ingrained part of some very special memories for me. When I hear certain songs, it takes me back to my younger days. It, it makes me think of my mother, who's since passed, who was a musician who lost her hearing in her late teenage years. And it wouldn't be until maybe I was seven or eight years old when I would realize that she was fully deaf. I knew she was hard of hearing, but I didn't think she was completely deaf because she would still play piano. She would play guitar. She would sing. And I have memories of standing next to her by the piano as she would play Weekend in New England or Rhinestone Cowboy by Glenn Campbell and, of course, Lady by the Little River Band. And I would stand there and sing with her. And these are very special memories to me. So over the years, I've continued to listen to these songs. Well, while working on that post in January, I became, I became ashamed because it occurred to me that while I consider myself a fan of the music, I really didn't know anything about the band themselves. I didn't know the names or the faces of the men whose voices had the ability to, to trigger some very special memories for me, B. Bertels, Glenn Shork, Graham Goble. And as I began to dig into it, I realized, okay, I want to tell the story here. And as I started talking to other people, I found that more and more people were in the same position. They knew the songs, they loved the songs, they knew the name of the band, but they didn't know the names or the faces of the people behind the music. So that became the focus of my story, the music and the men behind the music. Well, as I started digging into it, the shame continued to grow because I realized there was a deeper, darker story behind the music that I, I, that I was going to have to address. I looked for ways to avoid it, but the reality is as I started doing early posts, I would get comments like, um, the original members lost their voice when they knowingly sold their rights to the music. And what I would come to learn is not all the members knowingly of their choice and execution gave up their rights to the name of the band. I, I, I have to address this because it plays a part in the greater story, which is why I reached out to you, because as the narrative began to form, I realized there's probably an aspect here that you would want to give your perspective on. And I wanted to represent that perspective because look, at the end of the day, it's hard as hell to make a living as a musician. And I respect the guys in your band. Uh, I've, I've looked up their stuff as solo musicians. They're phenomenally talented and I respect them as musicians. And the last thing I wanted to do was to attack them. But there was an element to the story that had to be told and you chose not to respond to me. And so I moved forward the best I could with the information I had been able to gather. And the information came very close directly from the source of events and that had been double checked and then, you know, even triple checked, checked through different sources outside of that. So I moved forward with the knowledge that I'd been able to attain up until this point without your input. And I tried to do it very respectfully to your band. In fact, um, I would say I did it in a far more respectful way than that Rolling Stone article that uh, insinuated that you performed shitty versions of the hits. I, I never would have said that. I acknowledged your legitimate right as owner, exclusive owner of the Little River Band name, and even went as far as to make sure that I was very clear to acknowledge your longstanding, yours and Mr. Nelson's longstanding relationship with the Little River Band name and your relationship with the original founders of the Little River Band and how they brought uh, Mr. Nelson and yourself on board as session musicians in 1980 and 1981, how they brought you on as owners and directors in 1987, and even explaining how, Mr. Housen, you became the legitimate and exclusive owner of the Little River Band trademark. I never questioned the legitimacy of it. I was trying to be very upfront. And Mr. Nelson even going as far as to make sure that people understood that you were or are the recorded voice on the song, The Night Owls, which at the time was probably my favorite Little River Band song with your voice being implanted into my very special memories. Now, this whole thing has corrupted my memories and my experience and my love for that song, which I'll have to tease out at another time. But nonetheless, I was always respectful of your involvement with this band, which brings me to your cease and desist letter, because in it, you talk about protecting your rights. And I understand that. But what I'm curious about is how you protect and respect the rights of others. Because you see, the best I can tell is you bought the rights to the band name. And when you did that, you did not get the rights to any of the songs. The rights to the hit songs are still with the men who wrote and originally recorded those songs. B. Bertels, Glenn Shork, Graham Goble, David Briggs. 
you do not own the rights to those songs, but yet you continually perform them. And I'm left believing that if given the opportunity, the songwriters, the ones who own those rights, would not grant you the ability to perform those songs because in 2015, Glenn Shore blocked your band from performing on the Jimmy Fallon show by not granting them a sync license. And he went as far as to say that they've tried to stop you, stop your band from performing these hit songs live, but there's really nothing they can do about that. Um, at best also, I can tell in doing the research, it doesn't seem like your band is submitting the set lists to the PMO so that the performance uh, royalty fees being paid by the venues are being properly allocated back to the songwriters. And I realize we're talking about paltry amounts on the fees, uh, and but I do hope that your band is submitting those set lists so that the songwriters are getting their proper credit and payment for your performance fees. Because after all, again, we want to protect the rights. You want to protect your rights. I'm sure you want to also protect the rights of the men whose songs your, your band is performing. Your cease and desist letter also talks about protecting your business venture in the U.S. And my question to you is, is the business venture that you want to protect the business model that's based on leveraging the sense of nostalgia and the emotions and people like me who have memories attached to the music, you want to leverage that in order to sell tickets to bring people to your concert for your band to perform songs that they don't own the rights to. Or at least not all of them. And I know some of the songs you, you, your band did write and they own, but I'm talking about the classic original Little River Band hits. You don't own the rights to those, but you want to build a business model off of performing on those. So just make sure I'm clear on this one. And I find it interesting that in 2016, one year after your band was blocked from performing on the Jimmy Fallon show, you released an album called The Hits Revisited, where nine of the 11 songs on that album, you don't even own the rights to. And the two songs that, the other two songs that you probably do have ownership of the rights to, or at least access to it, I don't even know if these are hits. I don't know these songs at all. But on the album, five of the songs, five of the hits are credited to Graham Goebel, three to Glenn Shorrock, one to David Briggs. So again, you're putting out an album with songs that you don't own the rights to, and I'm fairly confident that the folks who do own the rights would not give you permission if they if they could stop you. And in doing my research on these series of posts, it really took me a while to try to figure things out because there's a lot of events that have taken place that add confusion to the narrative and the legacy. So for example, the first resource I went to in doing my research was the, the reallittleriverband.com webpage. And I found it interesting that in 2004, the Little River Band was um, honored by the Australian Recording Industry Association and, and you're glad to add that part of the legacy onto your website. But the reality is, is that was not the band under your ownership tenure that they were celebrating. It was the original, the classic lineup. But to your credit, you did release license long enough for one night for the classic lineup to come together to perform as the Little River Band. And it sounded like they kicked ass. Hang on, help is on its way. And looking through your website, what really disappointed me is that it seems like um, where convenient, you'll attach the, the, the name Little River Band to elements of its legacy, such as the hit songs and, and the accolades. But nowhere on the page do you reference the names of the people that actually wrote and originally recorded the songs, making them hits, uh, which essentially is the, the foundation for your entire business model. You know, a lineup of musicians who in their heyday put up as many hit songs as the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac. And sadly, whose story is very deserving of being told in a, in a place like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I don't ever see it happening now because it is just it, the current state is just too confusing. Um, it's too it's a mess. So tragically, I don't ever see that happening. And in a point in time where we are quickly losing musicians, songwriters and voices from the past decades, voices and you know, musicians that we've attached our memories to, at a time when we should be solidifying legacies, it almost feels like, and my question to you is, are you deliberately trying to erase these men's names from the legacy of the band or from history in general? So it's very confusing to me what your actions are, which is why I wanted to talk to you. And you know, I'll make the changes to my prior videos. I'll uh, remove your trademark. I will look for opportunities to hardly even reference your, your band, because the reality is the story is no longer about the band. You bought the band name, but you didn't buy the rights to the music. And for me, the story is about the music and the memories and the, the, the artists who wrote and recorded that music that play an important association with mine and other people's memories. That would be B. Bertels, Glenn Shork, Graham Goebel. 
the founders, the original voices of the Little River Band. <laughs> 